All right. Today's lesson is uh, the beginning of a series of lessons in Psalm number 119, a psalm that you may be familiar with that is about the Word of God in uh, an uh, acrostic. It's a Hebrew acrostic, meaning the the paragraphs, the stanzas, however you want to call it, the groupings of the poetry are according to the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Uh, that is not terribly meaningful to us, since uh, I don't think any of us knows Hebrew, and we're not reading it in Hebrew anyway, so so be it. But that's the organization of the psalm. I think that has had plenty of uh, devotees and plenty of ink spilled on the acrostic form, the stanzas, et cetera. Instead, I would like to look at a thing that's always been a question in my mind, and then it was brought to me by people who are near and dear to me, and uh, decided to do the study into this thing, which uh, in previous years was not something that could be done because it is too lengthy and involved. But now it can be done, and I'm thankful for that. Which is, when you start reading Psalm 119, if you're at all familiar with it, or even if you aren't familiar with it, you only need to get about uh, through Aleph, the first seven lines or so, when you realize that there are, uh, you know, a half dozen different words here, all of which seem to be about the law of God. And uh, it's not necessarily clear in my mind what they mean or how you separate them one from another to get the meaning out of that. So it's something that's always been on my mind, I guess, for a long time. And so now I'm going to try to answer those things and hopefully share that with everybody here in a helpful way. So again, there are many different words for the Word of God that are used in Psalm 119. And, uh, you know, we'll start at the start um, again, the first stanza, the Aleph stanza, is um, where you have all of these words being introduced. And the first verse of the psalm is the word law, which is the one we're going to focus on today. But there are also other words that happen. In the second verse, there is testimonies. In the fourth verse, there is precepts. In the fifth verse, there is statutes. In the sixth verse are commandments. The seventh verse are rules. And, you know, I think a casual glance at this tells you, well, they all seem to be something like a law, a code, a rule. And that's true. They, they do have uh, among them, uh, all of them feature some shade of meaning that corresponds to a law or a rule. But they are pretty different from each other in other ways. And it seems clear that the reason they are being used is not because we are struggling with what letter of the alphabet we are on, <laughs> since all of these words are occurring under Aleph um, and under all the other ones too. It's because there are shades of meaning there that are useful, and I hope to bring those shades forth for everybody's benefit. The word law is the first one, and probably with good reason. It occurs in the first verse. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. And um, I have down here a little note which is uh, in parentheses here on the chart, and that is H8451. What is that, you say? Well, that is something known as a Strong's number. And uh, I tell you this so that you can know how to do the study, because I don't know Hebrew. Um, I can't read Hebrew. I think I would recognize an Aleph if I saw it, because I've seen it frequently enough in other contexts, but no, I really don't know Hebrew. Um, so how did I do this study? Well, 
The way I did the study was by means of Strong's numbers. Now, Strong, as you know, is a fella who did an exhaustive concordance of the Bible. And uh, it's called exhaustive because if you've ever tried to carry one, you know you get rather exhausted quickly. Um, it is a formidable tome, but it does, in fact, exhaust everything that was available to them at the time that he wrote this, somewhere in the 1800s, I think. And uh, shows you every occurrence of every word wherever it happens in Scripture. This is useful because it's getting at the original language, the Hebrew, um, or the Greek in the New Testament, but in the Old, the Hebrew, it's useful because sometimes we will translate a word in more than one way, and so more than one English word might actually be translating the same Hebrew word. And the opposite is also true. There might be more than one Hebrew word, all of which are being translated by the same English word, and so it can be hard to use just strong straight out of the box like it is in English, you may not have the same language underneath it. That's fine. That's why the numbers are there. You can see exactly what number it is. Now, the limitation of Strong's, especially in printed format, is that he doesn't have an index of the numbers. You have no way of looking things up by the Strong's number, which corresponds to the original uh, word. That's where blueletterbible.org comes in. If you go to blueletterbible.org, on your browser, uh, on your phone, it all works. I don't work for them or get any commissions, and I don't recommend donating to them either because they're a religious organization. But it's a useful tool, and they have a c complete Strong's number search, which shows you all the verses that contain that word in the original language, whether it's Hebrew or whether it's Greek. The Hebrew ones start with the letter H, and I'm going to guess that that stands for Hebrews, although I can't tell you with certainty. So, H8451 is the word in Hebrew that corresponds to the law, and it's a word you may have heard, which has come into English as Torah, the Torah, T-O-R-A-H. Right, that's the Torah, the law. Um, it's the umbrella for the entirety of what God has revealed. Okay, to the best of what I can tell, and here's how. I can say there is a method in this madness. I'll go back to Genesis 26, verse 5, because this word Torah occurs there, and there are a bunch of other words too. You notice there, the Lord said, Abraham obeyed my voice, and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. That law there is Torah. That's our word from Psalm 119, verse 1. Now, what I'm using this verse for is to point out there is method in this. There are ver uh, words here that are side by side. A charge, a commandment, a statute, a law. Yes, they all have in common that they seem to have something to do with law or rule. That is correct. But you would never say, Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my rule, my rules, my rules, and my rules. It, they obviously don't mean the same thing, and they were not intended to mean the same thing. The reason why he gives you all these words is because there are shades of meaning that are different between them, and you're supposed to learn what that is and learn from it. So that's what we're doing, if that makes sense. I hope that that makes sense, because that's all the explanation I'm going to give. Now, back in Exodus 24, verse 12, we have another, what I would say, definition here. Not just as differentiated from other terms, but on its own, the thing that was written down on the tablets of stone for that Moses carried, the Lord wrote something down there. What is it? It is the law, which I, the Lord, have written for their instruction. So the, the word of God as given to the people is the law. That's what is written on the tablets of stone. Just to give you an idea, this is a useful thing. Then, when I started looking at this word, and I've already forgotten the Strong's number because, you know, it's just a link you click on. But whatever the Strong's number is, this word, Torah, 
looking at the list of all the verses that contain this word, that's where we begin with the sections that follow now, which will help to define the term from the verses, because I cannot define the term for you any other way. I don't know Hebrew. I do not have a degree in Hebrew. I don't trust any of the Hebrew lexicons with which I am familiar. So, I will do it in another way, a different way, which is, look at all the verses where the word occurs, understand the context of that verse, and think about what then does this word mean. That's how you do it. Let the Bible define its own terms. There's another way of thinking about that. If I had an education in Hebrew, if I thought that I could find an objective Hebrew lexicon, I would do so, but I don't um, at the moment. Maybe one day uh, I'm getting to be an old enough dog to have a hard time with new tricks. In the meantime, the first thing that I notice is that the overwhelming majority of uses of the word Torah in the Old Testament are in Leviticus. If you got to look at one place where this gets used over and over other than Psalm 119. <laughs> you got to exclude Psalm 119. That throws off all of the charts. <laughs> but outside of that Psalm, it occurs most often in Leviticus, and it is cases, cases as in this is the law for when this happens, right? Leviticus 6, 9, this is the law of the burnt offering. Torah for burnt offerings, as in here are all the rules for how you do a burnt offering, Levitical priests. Leviticus six fourteen, and this is the law of the grain offering. And 25, this is the law of the sin offering. 7 1, this is the law of the guilt offering. When you look at the detailed verses that follow these headers, it's the rules. What is offered? What are the conditions uh, that are attached to that thing that's being offered? What is the method by which it is to be offered? Who offers it? Does it get consumed? Does some of it get consumed? Who consumes it? Where do they consume it? All these questions about how do they worship God in great detail, fall under the heading of the law. 7.11, the law of the sacrifice of peace offerings that one may offer, which are, those are voluntary. 37 of Leviticus 7, the law of the burnt offering, grain offering, sin offering, guilt offering, ordination offering, and peace offering. This is the concluding statement about this now are, our, you know, chapter 6, chapter 7, are all the instructions for the priests about how you perform these offerings. What is to be accepted? How is it to be handled? Right, that's the summary. You also find 1146. Here is the law about beast and bird, living creatures that move through the waters, and creatures that swarm on the ground. These are about eating, right? This is the law, 127. For the woman who bears a child, the child, male or female, I realize that's confusing in modern society. It is the child who is either male or female. But there's a law, there's a, a governing principle, a governing set of rules for how you deal with this circumstance. 1359, we are looking at leprous disease. This is the law for a case of leprous disease in a garment of wool or linen, linen, either in the warp or in the woof, in any article made of skin to determine whether it is clean or unclean. So there's a category of things here, and there's rules about how you do that. That's the law of God for this thing. Then, 1432, the law for the one in whom is a case of leprous disease, that is, a person has some kind of lesion, who cannot afford the offerings for his cleansing. Now what do we do? There's a law for that. A case. 1454, here is the law for any case of leprous disease. Umbrella. 
Leviticus 14.57, to show when it is unclean, when it is clean, this is the law for leprous disease. So that's a little envelope. 15.32, here is the law for the one who has a discharge and for the one who has an emission. So things happen in life. Some of them are gross, but the law is there to govern that too. Numbers 5.29, this is the law in cases of jealousy, when a wife, though under the husband's authority, goes astray and defiles herself. So that's a case. There's rules for that. There's governance for that provided in the law. There's a set of rules, a, a way of conducting this, a way of determining what has happened, whether it has happened, who must be brought forward, what must they do, what is the action of the priest, right? Number 613, here's the law for a Nazarite. And it's true, there's a vow for a Nazarite that is lengthy, and there's a whole bunch of rules about how they are to be handled and what they do when they offer, or if they choose to offer, if they don't choose to offer, if they have money, if they don't have money. All these cases are handled under the heading of, this is the law. And Numbers 19.14, this is the law when someone dies in a tent. <laughs> So what do you do about this contained area where there has been somebody who has died? Who can go in? Who can go out? What are the rules about a person who has touched this, this person or who has been inside this tent? All this stuff is part of the law. This is the overwhelming um, number of cases Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. It means people through life, through all kinds of circumstances, and we just got a smattering, just a smattering of what's out there, but all kinds of circumstances, birth, death, marriage, divorce, health and illness, you know, sin and peace, all kinds of circumstances in life, there is a law, there's a, a, a rule, there's something from God that tells them how to worship in this case. There's something for them to do, there's something for them to bring, there's an order to follow. All throughout life, they're being governed by God through this law. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. You're blameless. Your way is blameless, as in your life, your conduct, your behavior is blameless if you are continually through all circumstances of life seeing what does God want in this? What does God want in my, you know, parenting? What does God want in my marriage? What does God want in my sickness and in my health? in my peace and in my need for repentance. You're continually checking these things and following the instructions that are delivered to you in the law. That is when you are blameless. That's when you are blessed. If we're looking at cases, and we were, but we should look also there's another place where law comes up, which I think is a pretty cool one, in Deuteronomy 1 and Deuteronomy 4. We read about the Lord having given a law, having finished and written down everything that governs them, the Ten Commandments, as well as all the kinds of offerings and stages of life that are governed by the law that we read about. Uh, or that you can read about on your own. You can use Blue Letter Bible as well as I can. But in the final analysis, the summary of that is, has anybody ever been given something as great as this law? Which the answer is no. <laughs> to the Jews belong the oracles of God, right? Now, Deuteronomy 1.5, beyond the Jordan, in the land of Moab, Moses undertook to explain this law, the Torah. So now they've gone beyond the Jordan, they're in Moab, and they're doing this a second time. He undertook to explain this law. That's where, by the way, 
I do know Greek, and Deuteronomy is Deuter is the second or a repeat, and nom or nomi is law or custom. It's a second law because of Deuteronomy 1.5. It's the second time that they are given the full law. Because this now is the second generation from Egypt. The first generation have died in the wilderness. This generation now, he undertakes to explain the entire law to them. And in summary there in Deuteronomy 4, very helpful, at verse 8 is, What great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? And there's our word law, Torah. And yes, there are other words there, statutes and rules. And yes, they do come up in later studies. Stay tuned. But for today, the law is that umbrella, that summary of everything that has been handed down to us through Moses. And the question stands, has any nation obtained something so righteous, such justice direct from the mouth of God, as has been given in this law set before the nation today? And the answer is no. Never had any nation seen this kind of favor from God to be given the rules for how to conduct their entire life cycle. Everything that they need to do to be pleasing to him at every stage of life and every need, whether it's good or whether it's evil, whether it's a blessing or whether it's a curse, the law has the answer for how we do something about this. How do we conduct ourselves in this case? And no nation could produce such a thing. God did this for the people of Israel. And we, of course, have benefited from that directly, since to the Jews belong the oracles of God. They wrote the entire Bible. You might take exception with the letter from Nebuchadnezzar or something like it. Fair enough, Nebuchadnezzar wrote that, but obviously an Israelite gathered that and included it in the book of Daniel. All right, so... Yeah, Israelites wrote the whole thing. <laughs> the entire New Testament is written by Israelites too. We owe everything to this nation. And we owe everything to God who provided for this nation the way to be a nation, the way to stay alive, the way to preserve his will and to accomplish his purpose. That is the law set before that nation, Israel, Deuteronomy 4.44. Right. Now I have to think. Let's do this. There's more to cover than we can cover this morning. But we have this section, and we'll be done. The law is publicly accessible in Deuteronomy 27. So we've seen that the law governs all cases. We've seen that the law is unique in the world. God has done something with this nation he has chosen of the seed of Abraham. And in this point today we see that the law is to be made accessible to everybody. Right? Deuteronomy 27, verse 1, beginning, Moses and the elders of Israel commanded the people, saying, Keep the whole commandment I command you today, and on the day you cross over the Jordan to the land the Lord your God is giving you, you shall set up large stones and plaster them with plaster, you shall write on them all the words of this law. When you cross over to enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord the God of your fathers has promised you. And when you've crossed over the Jordan, you shall set up these stones, concerning which I command you today on Mount Ebal, and you shall plaster them with plaster, 
So he gives them the rules about how you're going to do it, but skip a little to verse 8. You shall write on the stones all the words of this law very plainly. That's the point of plaster. The point of the plaster is contrast, clarity. You can see very clearly. They can write in large letters and make a clear contrast what it's calling for is this place right when you enter the land that's on a hill or a mountain where you got large stones set up these stone structures maybe monoliths you would say and they have been plastered so that you can put very clean, clear, visible writing. That writing is the law of Moses. And this law is written in such a way with the intent that everybody who comes into the land sees that there is law. It's right there. I guess it's above your nose, not under your nose. But you know what I mean. It's plain sight as you come in. And you stop. And you have a chance now to see this is what the God who is worshipped here tells his people to be and to do. It's also a place where the Israelites themselves, from their dwelling in their newly acquired Canaanite properties can come up and refresh themselves as to what the law says. It's publicly available. It's publicly accessible. It's in writing that is clear on stones that are not going to move. They're not going to become illegible based on weather patterns or whatever else. They'll be able to go and to read all the words of the law of God for themselves. My question on this deal is, how then do you think that we should display the word of God today? I'm not suggesting that we put stones out front and write down the entire Bible for everybody to read. What I'm suggesting is that you are the stones. The law is not to be written on tablets of stone, but on hearts of flesh. How should the law be displayed today? The law of God, I mean, not the law of Moses, which is godly and right, but is not the thing we're talking about now. Today I'm talking to you who are Christians, who are fulfilling the law of liberty, the perfect law of liberty, the law of Christ. How should it be displayed? Should it be the first thing that people see when they come in? Should it be accessible to whoever wants to ask you? Should they be able to ask you about the Bible and you answer them plainly in a way they can understand? Yes, it should. Should it be the first thing that is seen, that is known about you? The, the, you know, the fabric of your being, the backbone of, of your existence as a person? Yes, it should. It should be an objective standard that has been set up that you refer back to the Word of God is. And check your own progress and check your own case and make corrections if necessary. That's why it's described as a mirror in James. It's there to look into and see imperfections and correct them. How should we display it if they were required to make it publicly available, to make it permanent, to make it visible to anybody who walks by, accessible to whoever wants? How should the Bible be in your heart and on your lips? That's all we're getting at. How should we display the word of God today? What Should that be clear that we serve God? Should it be clear that we are Christians? 
Should it be clear that we love the Lord above all? Can we really say that our way is blameless? Well, we can if we walk in the law of the Lord. If we walk in the Bible, if we if the Bible is our standard, our guide, our authority, we are subject to God through his word, then yes, you can understand that there is a blessing for you. In Psalm 119 and in Matthew 5, when Jesus pronounces blessings on many circumstances and situations. So the law, the law blesses when a person makes it their way, their walk, their norm. And that is the end of part one. We will come back to it, the Lord willing. There are other things to talk about regarding law. Let's see. Hmm. That's not what's supposed to happen. There you go. Well, we mentioned already that there may be some present who are not Christians. As good as the law was for them, and as wonderful as it was that God provided for them something like that law that was a complete guide to life, we today have a greater law in Christ Jesus, the perfect law of liberty, which guides everything, the heart and the mind as well as the steps that you take. Today, if you're not a Christian, become a Christian to obtain for yourself forgiveness from God, to enter into this covenant relationship with God, to become a citizen in his heavenly kingdom, and partake in blessings that are greater still than the blessings even under the law of Moses, which were real and considerable. Confess Jesus with the mouth as the Son of God. Repent in your heart of the former ways and put to death the old person in baptism for forgiveness of sins. The blood of Jesus washes away every sin and ratifies your agreement with God and you become a Christian. We'll help you to be baptized. There's water available if that is your need. Today, are you already a Christian but have not been doing these things, have not been putting God's word first, have not been making it clear, have not been holding to the intent of God's law for you and for everyone? Well, repent. Repent before it is too late. But let us help you too with our prayers on your behalf because, well, everybody needs prayers. Nobody has achieved a sinless perfection. If you need our prayers, we're glad to do it. If you need to obey the gospel, please let your need be known at this time by coming to the front while we stand and sing.